Hi, next I tell you about the case of being an L2, which is particularly nice because we can compute things much easier there, and we have very nice convergence theorems there too. Again, I would like to start with a reminder. So this is the, uh, the paper from the previous video, and I want, I'd like to tell you about Yapunov's inequality, which exactly told us that x q norm is less than or equal to x p norm if q is smaller than p. If you look back what Yapunov's uh, inequality was, then this is what, what, what exactly it said. And this is going to be important next because if I say that p is 2 and q is 1, that means that the 2 norm is uh, larger than or equal than the 1 norm. So being in L2 is more restrictive than being in L1. Anything that's in L2 is also in L1. If this is finite, then that is finite for Q1 and P2. Anything in L2 is also in L1. But if you're in L1, you might not be in L2. So being in L2 is more restrictive than being in L1. And so in this video, I'm going to cover the case when that's the case, when we are also in L2, not only in L1. So I'm going to tell you about L2 Martingales, meaning that the Martingale is in L2 for every n. And again, this is more restrictive. Not all Martingales are in L2. If we are in L2, then we are lucky because we have much more tools to us available. But that's not always the case. So assume now that this is true, that we are in L2. And in that case, there is some very nice property, which I wanted to start with. Namely, if I look at the increment of my martingale, and I'm going to use letters U and V now, then this is going to be orthogonal to L2 generated by the sigma algebra generated, uh, uh, the, sigma, the, the, the sigma algebra generated by um, by anything happening up to time u, okay? Uh, now this sounds a little bit strange and, uh, and uh, you know, a, a little bit uh, uh, funny, <coughs> but, but here's what's really, what's really happening here. So what does it mean orthogonal, first of all, and what does it mean, what, why is L2, L2 so nice? So if we have a square integrable random variable, so second moment is finite, then we can define kind of a scalar product. So I'm not going to go much into the details of this, but if I look at two random variables and I consider the expectation of the product, this will be finite by Cauchy-Schwarz if x and y are in L2, and this acts like a scalar product between two random variables. It's like the, vector, the dot product in vectors. Okay? You can, in some sense, think about random variables as vectors, and this would be the dot product, the scalar product, on vectors. And in that sense, we can talk about orthogonality. So I'm going to now actually tell you what I mean by that. So this is kind of, okay, this is a little bit kind of abstract. But what I mean by that is indeed that for every v larger than u, larger than uh, t larger than s, I have the following, and here as well already I, I should have said that v is larger than u, then the following is true. Look at the expected value of the increment mt minus ms multiplied by the increment mv minus mu, and what you get is a big zero. Okay, and in that sense, the increment from s to t of my martingale and the increment of, of my martingale from u to v are orthogonal in that sense that the scalar product is zero or this product of the expectation is zero. How would you prove something like this? It's very simple to do. So if you want to prove this, it's very simple to do. The expectation of uh, this thing is the expectation of mt minus ms times mv minus mu conditioned on any, I could put any sigma algebra here, I'm going to put fu, and then an outer expectation. So this is just the tower rule. 
expectation of the condition expectation okay now u is larger than t and s in fact i could as well i could as well put inequality here actually and u is larger than t and s or larger than equal which means that mt and ms are fu measurable okay these things both of these is fu measurable just by the martingale being adaptive anything that's fd measurable can be factored out from the condition expectation so i have mt minus ms times the condition expectation mv minus mu given a few okay there are lots of parentheses uh, the outer expectation is still there and uh, everything in in there is uh, just just still in there but i can factor out this mt minus ms increment from the condition expectation because it is a few measurable so i do that and then by the martingale property i get a zero here that's by m being a martingale okay Notice I'm not talking about super or sub martingales here, these are martingales. Okay, so we have this orthogonality uh, relation. And that implies a nice theorem called, well, the, okay, let's see, the, let's see what the theorem is, and that some property of the theorem will be called the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, so the theorem says the following. Theorem. Uh, suppose that we have a martingale in L2. So an L2 martingale. Mn. Is bounded. In L2. If and only if. If and only if. We have the following, if I do a sum, let me do it here, from 1 through infinity of the expected increment squared, or the second moments of the increments, or if you want the variance of the increments, same thing because it means 0, is finite. Okay, so again notice that I take the increment, I take its square, then I take an expectation, then I take a sum. If the infinite sum is finite, that's exactly when we have boundedness in L2. What does it mean to be bounded in L2? Remember, bounded in L2 means that the supremum of the L2 norms is finite. So there is a uniform bound for all of the L2 norms, which holds for each n. Okay? That happens if and only if this infinite sum is finite. In this case, in this case, in this case, we have almost sure and L2 convergence. Mn converges to a limit m infinity almost surely and also in L2, both. Almost surely and in L2, which of course implies that m infinity is sort of finite almost surely and it's in L2. Okay, that's the theorem. So if you have a L2 bounded martingale, you can characterize that by this infinite sum being finite, and you can uh, then have, of course, a limit both in L2 and in M infinity. Uh, uh, sorry, both in L2 and almost surely. Let me let me prove this. And the proof starts with the Pythagorean theorem. What is the Pythagorean theorem you probably all remember is that if you have orthogonal sides of a triangle then c squared is a squared plus b squared. Now we do have orthogonality for martingales, for L2 martingales. This is exactly some kind of an orthogonality. This is why I say it's orthogonality for L2 martingales because these kind of scalar products are zero. And that's exactly what's needed for the Pythagorean theorem. So if I want to start looking at the L2 norm, L2 norm square, to be honest. So remember, this is the square of the L2 norm of the martingale Mn. Then what do I do? Well, 
is the expectation. So, so one way of writing M n is of course to look at M naught and all the increments from one from zero to n. So I'm doing a telescopic sum here, m k minus m k minus one, summed up from one through n. That's a telescopic sum. Surviving terms are um, k equals to n for this part, which is m n, and k equals to one for that part, which is m zero. If I add m0, then I'm just left with mn. So this is just plain algebra to rewrite mn this way. I take a square of it and then an expectation. Okay, and so what happens when I start expanding this square is that I'm going to have some pure square terms under the expectation. So I'm going to have expectation of m0 square. I'm going to have all of the square terms of the increments, so mk minus mk minus 1 squared, that's what's coming from squaring these terms individually, and then I have an expectation on them, it's a finite sum, I swap the expectation and the sum, and that's what I get there, and then I have the cross terms. I will have terms like m0 times m1 minus m0, and m0 times m2 minus m1, and so on, and so on. I also have cross terms from the sum, m3 minus m2 times m2 minus m1 multiplied together under the expectation, and that's where the Pythagorean theorem comes into play, that's where the orthogonality comes into play. If you have different ranges of increments here, which exactly what happens for each of these cross terms, including the one with m0, then all of those expectations are zero. So whenever you have a cross term from this square, whenever you have terms like m5 uh, minus m4 multiplied with m2 minus m, uh, m3 minus m2, the expectation of those is all zero, and that includes the ones including that, that contain m0. So all the cross terms give you a big zero here. This big zero comes from all the cross terms under the expectation. The expectation of any cross term is zero, okay? And uh, so at this point we are we're done, right? This thing is the sum of non-negative uh, quantities because these are squares. Expectation of squares is non-negative. So this thing increases up to this infinite sum, which is supposed to be finite. So it follows that we have bound in L2 m is bounded in L2. Again, why is that? Because if I take the expectation of m n square, that's smaller than or equal, well, that's actually equal, just copying the line above, m not square plus this sum k goes from 1 through infinity e of m k minus m k minus 1 square. This thing is non-decreasing in n, and it converges to a finite limit, namely the infinite sum of the same second moment, which is finite by assumption. Okay, here we have this assumption up there. So there is a uniform bound. This one doesn't depend on n. There's a uniform bound on the L2 norms, or the square of the L2 norms, same thing, essentially, um, which exactly means we're bounded in L2. Now, remember, Yopunov's inequality, if it's bounded in L2, then it's also bounded in, also bounded in L1. L1 norm is less than or equal than the L2 norm. If it's bounded in L1, then dupe converge, convergence, dupe, oops, dupe's forward convergence theorem applies. This applies. And we know that Mn converges almost surely to m infinity. There is an almost sure limit. There is some infinity as the limit, and we have almost sure convergence to there. Now, this does not prove L2 convergence. This just proves almost sure convergence. 
the theorem said that we have convergence almost surely, which part is done, but also in L2, so almost sure is done, but we also have convergence in L2, so let's, we, we still need to prove that bit. Let me show you how that goes. So what does it mean to converge in L2? To converge in L2 I need to look at m infinity minus m n's second norm. Or, well, this is the square of the second norm. I need to show that this converges to zero. That's what it means to converge in L2, okay? So for this second bit here, L2 convergence, I need to show that this goes to zero. Okay, now these are non-negatives. I can actually apply Fatou's lemma. This is a limit, a normal sure limit, which means it's on the inf, and the expectation of a limit is smaller than or equal than the limit of the expectation. So this is Fatou's lemma. I take the limit of, actually I'm going to do a limit in R, of the expectation, and now I'm going to do something interesting. I'm going to start, so, okay, so what is M infinity? M infinity is the limit of the M k's. Instead of M k's, I'm going to write N plus R's. Okay, so instead of m infinity, I think of m infinity as the limit of m n plus r in r, the limit in r. Okay, that's why I can write that. Now, this is equal to the limit, and at this moment I'm looking at a finite increment. I'm going to do the Pythagorean theorem above. The expectation of the increment square is just the sum of the individual increments. Uh, in the uh, in the in in, in a second moment, so the Pythagorean theorem tells me that if I do a sum from m plus one to m plus r of the expectation of m k minus m k minus one square, then this is exactly what I get. So here the Pythagorean theorem went from m naught. This bit here went from m0 to mn, it's the same issue here, except it goes from mn to mn plus, one, m plus r. What I need to do is sum up the increments between n and m plus r under the second moment to get the second moment of the whole thing, mn plus r minus mn, it's the exact same idea. So that's the Pythagorean theorem here. I'm going to abbreviate this as Pyth. Okay. Uh, on the right hand side, what I see as a function of r is an increasing sum in r. These are non-negative uh, real numbers, expectations of, of something squared. These are non-negative numbers. I'm adding up more and more of them. So this sum is a non-decreasing non sum. It will have a limit. This limit, if there is a limit, which there is, then the limit is equal to this limit. So this is actually equal to the infinite sum from n plus 1 to infinity of expectation of m k minus m k minus 1 square. Okay? And this is a convergent sum because of the first bit. So we have, uh, we have L2, we have L2 bound, and that was shown already to be equivalent to this quantity, this sum being finite here. So the sum of the second moments of the increments is finite. Now I have exactly that sum, except I'm doing this from n. So I start this sum from n. I look at a convergent sum that goes from n. If I take now n to infinity, then any convergent sum summed up from n as n goes to infinity, will go to zero. The tail sum is uh, converging to zero. So as n goes to infinity, just because the original infinite sum is finite, this thing is going to go to zero. And that exactly means that I have L2 convergence of mn to m infinity.